talk about wealth of knowledge. You, you bring it all together. Put the work in now to get yourself structured and organized and documented. We need to grow this top, top line. There is no one size fits all for this industry. Hey there, thanks for checking out this episode of the Restoration Masterclass on Profitability sponsored by Encircle. Today, I'm excited to be keeping it all in the family. That's the topic of this episode of the series that we are working on. And I'm excited to have Jeff Moore with me. He is the president and chief acquisition officer of ATI. But ATI is also a massive, the biggest, I believe, family-run restoration company that exists. So, um, you know, I know that they've learned a lot of lessons over the years about how to increase their revenue and their profitability. And I wanted to bring him in to talk about that. So Jeff, I'm going to toss it right over to you. Have you share a little bit about your background in the industry, how you've come up through the company and then kind of the background of ATI in general? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, thanks for having me, Michelle, excited to, to be on, on today. Um, you know, a little history of ATI. My dad started the business in 1989. There's three brothers working in the business. I'm the oldest of the three. Um, you know, I, I think one of, sorry, I guess I should turn off my phone. Um, one of the, uh, I think the biggest things that my dad instituted for the three of us was making sure we all started at the bottom and worked our way up. And so um, we we all started in high school. Um, all of us worked through college and afterwards, and we've all had a multitude of roles. I think all of mm-hmm. us have worked in the field and construction, water mitigation, asbestos abatement. We were all project managers. We were all estimators. And I, I think one of the, the keys to success now is we're all operating in different roles. And, yeah. you know, there were times, um, you know, as we were smaller and a medium sized player where we definitely stepped on each other's toes. And I think the more as a family that you do step on each other's toes, it certainly makes it, it's everything that everyone imagines about being a family business. Um, and it can certainly be challenging, but as you grow and you have different responsibilities, the last thing you want to do, even as a even as a manager that's unrelated, is to contradict someone. But when you're a family member and contradicting each other, especially in front of peers, certainly makes it challenging. And you know, garnering respect for employees becomes more uh, more difficult. But you know, I, I think one of those keys is us finding our passion and what we're good at. And so, you know, today I head up our acquisition group. Uh, my little brother, Ryan Moore, um, he heads up the entire sales and marketing department. And then my middle brother, Scott, heads up like large loss and catastrophe operations. So we literally are not, I mean, I am on a call with my brother, Scott, on a board meeting once a month. And I have literally little to no involvement in what, because he's working behind the scenes in operations. So I think that's been really helpful for business owners, especially if you're working uh, honestly, Michelle, I met my wife at ETI. She was in <laughs> business development. So um, I, I learned really quickly that I was not going to work with another family member. So I told her, you know, when I asked her to marry me, that she couldn't continue to work for us because I already work with two brothers and a dad and I don't need to work with my wife. So it definitely brings a different dynamic. But um, I think you make really good, positive decisions on the organization being a family run business. So out of the three of you, the brothers, how many of you are involved in like the P&Ls, overall profitability, revenue, the numbers of the company? So I, I, at a board level, I think we're, we're all ultimately um, exposed and review numbers yeah. and have general understanding. But like in the weeds every day, I would say probably Ryan more so than anything. I'm involved on the M&A side of the numbers, less on the core business. I would say Scott's very, very uninvolved in the numbers outside of board meetings. So I would say Ryan's in the weeds on a daily, weekly basis. Dad's not involved at all. Again, he's only on the board level. So um, again, go back throughout the years. That is varied as the company is is scaled. Uh, We're trying to work on the business and not so much in the business. And I think that's certainly one of the, the key successes to drive a profitable business is allow your employees to do their jobs. But as you're an owner operator, you know, we t- it doesn't really matter what your title is. You tend to, to wear, you know, five or six titles and you're yeah. always overstepping your bounds. And, you know, you've got to learn to believe in your staff and your people and allow them to to fly or to to sink, wh- whichever one they're going to do. But, you know, you've got to learn to trust people, especially if you're looking to scale and increase profitability in the brand. So how has profitability changed for ATI? Once you and you 
you and Scott and Ryan determined your individual paths within the company. How did that help overall profitability in the company once you were able to divide and conquer? So I, I think if you look at our profitability over the last five years, we have increased exponentially. I think we divided responsibilities. Ryan and I were co-presidents literally three years ago and <laughs> literally had the same job description. And um, <laughs> we, on the bottom line, um, gross profit margins have increased more the last three to four years than they ever have in a five-year span. Um, bottom line, EBITDA has increased faster than it ever has. So I think as we've gotten out of each other's ways and allowed each of us to shine in those departments, profitability, both on a gross profit margin level, on a job basis, figuring out who's really focused in on that, instead of all of us being focused in on everything, which mm -hmm. meant we always had a hundred things to do, which means we never got anything done yes. um, because we were always, all of us were focused on it instead of Jeff is focused on this, Ryan's focused on that. And uh, you can see the organization is exponentially more focused on increasing the bottom line um, by having clear roles and responsibilities. You hinted at it early on in the conversation, but how have you learned over the years to separate personal and family life from work and business decisions? I mean, there are pictures of all you could together. I mean, you obviously, I think, still get along and you know are still family at the end of the day. So how do you separate that? So that's really challenging um, being yeah. in a family business. Um, at, at work, we look at each. You know, I, I. It doesn't matter if it's my brother or my dad. I, you know, you've got to, you've got to talk to people just like you would any other employee. So, you know, I, I don't refer to my dad as dad at work. I, if I'm talking to him about something personal, I refer to him as dad. And at work, it's it's Gary. And um, you never separate at home. When when you are a family business, work is home. Um, it doesn't matter how many times the wives or the kids may complain about it. It's just impossible not to talk about work stuff outside of work when it comes home, whether it's to the wife, your brothers, your dad. So I don't know that there's any getting away from that. I think you have to go out of your way to make sure you've got separation of church and state as well. So it's going on vacations. It's doing bonding with the family outside of work. And uh, one thing that we instituted was going on, like we do a week's vacation every summer um, dad started that probably eight or 10 years ago, all the grandkids go, and it truly is a vacation, uh, with me living out of state, it's more challenging to get all the grandkids together. And that truly is a week away. Uh, very little work is talked about because it's one of the few, the, the few times, it's probably the only time all year that all four of our phones are off and, uh, unconnected for, I wouldn't say the entire day for probably all, but an hour of the day, uh, okay. we are all there for each other personally and for the kids. That that's a really good idea. And how, is it difficult to turn the phones off or do you, have you gotten to the point where you look forward to like, all right, we get our one hour, we're getting this done and then it's off. So I, I think, I, I think all of my family members would say that I am much better at it than the other three. The other three are um, quite honestly, I think they're addicted to the phones and the emails, but I think that also is a reflection of the role that you're doing. I think the more you're involved in the core of the day-to-day -day operations, the more disconnecting gets really, really challenging. And then me and my role, I'm allowed to disconnect from the day-to-day -day the chaos of what may or may not be going on in the organization. So I think it's a function of your personality and your role within the organization. Okay, that's fair. Okay, uh, before we wrap it up, I also want to talk about ATI as a whole, because you look at ATI as a whole as a family, and there's kind of this um, back and forth within the industry of should we be teams? Are we families? Is one right? Is one wrong? Whatever that may be. And ATI has definitely gone the family route. So how is that just overall overarching I don't know, theme throughout the company helped with profitability, revenue, growth, those kind of things, that whole family mentality throughout the entire company? So I, you know, I, there, there's a lot of debate and honestly, the first, you know, before we kind of change our, our motto and our marketing programs to family, honestly, my dad was not a big fan, took a lot of convincing in many years because my dad associated a family business with, you know, chucking a truck and a really small operated business. Um, but since we've embraced that, that has been amazing. At the end of the day, Michelle, we all make the best decisions for our family. And that's, that's not putting profit first. That's not putting um, you're, you're putting people first at the end of the day, I'm always going to do what's best for my wife and my kids. And if I look at my family members in the business as my true family members, I'm always going to make the best decision based off our people, not best. It's not going to be based best off profitability. How are we going to look this month? How's that going to impact our bonuses? No, what's the right thing to do? 
And, and our ATI Cares motto, it's always about, you know, right thing always. It's about doing the right thing when, it, it, honestly, it's about doing it when no one's watching. It's not, it's easy to do the right thing whenever, when you're on the center and you're on stage, it's really easy to do the right thing. But are you going to do the right thing when no one's paying attention? And if you make every decision, whether it's acquiring a company, taking care of a warranty problem, hiring an employee, you, you've got to live by that motto of a family. And I truly believe that all of our employees look at each other as family members, even though we may not be you know, born into, you know, a family, obviously there's only four of us, I guess there's technically five of us in the business. We've got a cousin as well, but, you know, by looking at each other as family members and putting their interests first, uh, we always know as an organization, we are going to make the right decision because Mm -hmm. of that motto that we live by. And I think that's really what's defined our culture. I think that's what makes, honestly, I I would say, I believe, of course, I'm selfish. I think ATI has got the best culture out there, but I think at that that family value and at the core of the organization that does really drive that behavior and the decisions amongst the entire organization. Yes. I love it. Okay. Well, anything else you want to add about profitability and it doesn't even have to be related to ATI at this point. I know you have a wealth of knowledge in general in the industry and are highly involved. So any final tips on profitability? I've got a couple of things. So one person I follow online, there's a show called the profit Marcus Lamona. So talks about people process and product. Um, I've got a couple notes I like to share. So one of the things at the highest level as the owner, when it comes to people, you've got to work on the business, not in the business, especially if you're looking to scale and generate profitability. Um, I know a couple of the other people that you spoke to on this series um, talking about people, people at the core, that that is what makes us different. At the end of the day, there's 15,000 restores. We're all doing the same stuff. Yep. Your house has a flood. I don't know that it matters who you hire. At the end of the day, the, the product's going to be the same. It's how your people handle you. So are you, reta- are you retaining the people that you have? Are you making time for one-on-ones? Are you doing annual reviews? Are you embracing and investing in your culture? Because at the end of the day, that's the decision in someone staying with you and leaving. And I would say from a, a, a products side, are you really investing in your people? And when I say investing in your people, are you sending them to training? Are you investing in industry software? As an example, if you're an owner, how many of your staff have you actually sent for advanced exact wear certification? They've got level one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. Well, if, if you haven't sent any of your estimators, how can you expect them to truly know the product? How, how can you expect to increase profitability if you haven't invested in your staff? You've got actionable insights. You've got conferences. You've got IICRC designations. How many people have you really spent the time to allow them to go out of the business, not work on jobs, and invest in their future? Because that is how you make a difference um, in ultimate profitability. And I would say the other uh, thing when it comes to product and process really comes around to increase profit, you have to have estimating efficacy. So um, besides training, have you ever done peer review estimates? So are you you just letting one of your estimators, if you're the owner, are you literally looking at every estimate? Um, Because if you're not, someone should be especially mm-hmm. if they're larger jobs. And have you ever done audit on files? Oh, it was so eye-opening when ATI did this. It was like maybe five to eight years ago. And we said, you know what, we're going to do an audit. We're going to spend time. And we chose the best people in the company. And we randomly selected like 50 mitigation files, 50 construction files. And we chose them from our best estimators. And we were leaving money on the table on every single estimate. I don't care how long they'd been with us but you have to have a process. You've got to have a standard operating procedure. And if you truly are looking to drive the bottom line, you have to take that extra time and find one or two people on staff that's willing to do an audit. And the goal is to pick it apart. What could you have charged for? What did you do based off the photographs, but you didn't charge for? Because ultimately those are dollars that you should have been reimbursed for. You likely did the work. You just were I don't know if it was lazy on the estimate, you didn't take the extra time, you hadn't invested in the training for your people. And therefore, you know, we found we were leaving anywhere from 2% on the table to 30%, depending on the job. And that's an exercise I recommend all owners and managers do. Perfect. That's a lot of advice. I love it. Okay. All right. Um, Jeff, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate all of your expertise, of course, and I always enjoy catching up with you. 